All right, I'm going to send it over here with uh, Bill. Bill, your question? Uh, this new uh, space vehicle will be running. Are any of you involved in that? And, and are you hoping to go on that vehicle? Right. Uh, well, we're all involved in the, in the sense that we're supporting the, uh, the program in any way that a crew member could as they develop this vehicle. They take our inputs as operators of the vehicle in the way that they design the cockpit and um, any of the uh, interfaces that the crew will have with it. So in that sense, yes, we do uh, have um, a lot of involvement in the program. Um, as far as any of us being able to fly on it, I think you know, we're career astronauts and uh, we're uh, involved in the program and if we're blessed enough uh, to be part of that, then uh, we'll be selected as well. But uh, as far as any immediate assignments, I don't think any of us know about that yet. All right, we got uh, Chris down here, and I'm going to try to get to as many people as possible. I think I know what it's like to be on the space shuttle now, so we cramp down here, but I'm going to maneuver my way to as many as you would. Uh, Chris, go ahead, ask a question. I was wondering uh, why you choose space space. Why did you choose space? Anybody? Well, simple. Uh, there's, there's two There's personal reasons, and as mentioned by the people who go to choose to go to space. Uh, always we've been explorers since we were able to fall out of the case, what's over the next hill, what's beyond that river, and, and what's, what's beyond across the oceans. Uh, quite frankly, because we always get this habit of multiplying, and we tend to fill the earth to do it. And so what happens when we have filled the earth and we need more resources? Uh, there's things out there, there's the moon, there's Mars, there's places where we can get things to keep uh, mankind replenished without the damage and fragile ecosystems. That's why in the big picture we go to space. Uh, me personally, it's just the adventure of it. It's a uh, always going to fly, and it's uh, a way to do that. All right, I have Judy right here in front, and Judy, go ahead. As a mom and as a teacher, I don't think I'll be getting up into space as an astronaut, so I was wondering if each of you could tell us to see a phrase or an adjective that just will not bring it home about how it is out there. Tell us about it. <laughs> so you're line? Well, I think Barb is the only mom and the teacher. Okay, Barbara, why don't you take that? That's a tough one to come up with just an adjective. You really can't. Uh, we can probably maybe tell a short story that might help, help uh, illustrate it. Um, when one of, one of the first times we had an opportunity to look out the window, and it was uh, nighttime, we were uh, flying over Africa. And um, and actually it was daytime then if I remember right, but we were coming into the nighttime period. So here is these beautiful colors of uh, browns and golds, and I, I wish I had the, I wish I was an artist to be able to know what all the color names are that I saw. And uh, very quickly we were in nighttime, and when we were in nighttime, we were over the ocean, and it was full of thunderstorms. And what we what we always know is isolated thunderstorms. To me, looking down there, you realize they aren't isolated at all. They are a huge system that go miles and miles and miles, and each flash of lightning seems to trigger a storm that's many, many miles away. So you see all these flashes over and over again, and um, it's quite a sight. All right, Debbie here, and I'm going to get to that other side of the room. I'm making my way over there, so be patient. Everybody. Debbie, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you could give us a snapshot of what your roles were individually. It, it might just be a summary of what you did. Well, I'll, I'll pretty quick run just to kind of cover that for everyone. I was the, uh, the commander of the mission, and uh, which, from a, uh, like a, you put it in an airliner perspective, it was, I'm really the pilot, and Charlie Hobart here is the co pilot, and uh, we're responsible for flying the vehicle. Uh, we also have a flight engineer for accident entry, uh, Rick Mastracchio, he's our mission specialist too, he's a flight engineer. Uh, Tracy Caldwell is also on the flight deck for uh, ascent, uh, like Barb Morgan was on for entry. Uh, Tracy's primary responsibilities was as one of the robotics operators on the shuttle arm, but also the person that uh, directed or choreographed the space blocks from inside the, the uh, shuttle. Uh, Rick, in addition to being the flight engineer, was also uh, the lead 
spacewalking astronaut, and he did three spacewalks. And Dave was one of our other uh, spacewalkers, as well as a guy at Clay Anderson, who's not here. A very important part of our mission, but he's still on the space station, and he'll be there until October. And then uh, Barbara Morgan was uh, responsible for the uh, transfer of robotics on both the shuttle and the space station, and as well as the education activities we had. And uh, last but not least, Al Drew was at the mission late, uh, very late in our training flow, was responsible for the robotics, all the uh, photo TV equipment, the computer equipment we have on board, as well as a lot of other activities, uh, uh, some uh, maintenance activities on the space station, some things that we uh, repair on board the space station. All right, I've got uh, Raymond over here, all the air to the side. But to your, to your right, and Raymond, go ahead. Want to ask the question? How does it feel to re-enter the atmosphere? Let's know how it feels to re-enter the atmosphere. And I think specifically, Raymond just asked, he wants to know, do you hear the sonic flow? Is it as loud for you as it is for us here on Earth? Sure, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, I'll, I'll back it up a little bit. Uh, we come in at uh, like 25,000 feet per second. We basically need to slow down to zero. So. Uh, the way we do that is, is come slamming in the atmosphere, hitting air particles, and, and it's the uh, friction of the air with our vehicle that actually slows us down. And while we're doing this, we've gone, we've been in zero gravity for about you know, 13 days or so, and we start hitting the atmosphere, we get up to about a G and a half. And it doesn't seem like a lot. If you're in one G, you stand here, of course, and I'm not sure what you get out of the, uh, the attraction here. I think it's probably close to two. But when we're at a G and a half after being in two a G for so long, it, it feels like you're at four or more. It, it really, it really comes on you, and you, you just kind of sit there and, and, and you gut it out and burn it out, and you're thinking, yeah, I, I know I've done a whole lot worse than this, so this isn't really that bad. But it, it, it's a, it's a quick adaptation you have to go through. Um, you go from that uh, all the way back into uh, into one G. That um, it, it's a uh, uh, you're you're zipping by the earth, and, and this time. Uh, my first flight was actually, we re-entered at night, you can see the glow and the colors of the uh, re-entry heating uh, that's uh, like 3,000 degrees or slightly over. This time we were in daytime, so the only thing we got to see was some really cool landscape coming by. In fact, the neatest thing I remember seeing is uh, the, the Florida beaches up the east coast uh, along our re-entry path. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really neat experience. Uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, basically transitioning from being in that weightless environment and now back into gravity, uh, and you, you, it makes you feel heavy, but also it gives you a, a sense of uh, a tumbling if you move quickly. Uh, you know, it's called neuro, uh, neurovestibular, which is basically the semicircular canals in your uh, in your ear that uh, they kind of trick you. So um, have your dad do this when he takes you home today. Put you in his chair, spin you around about ten times real quick, and then get up. <laughs> No, tell us, we were professionals, this is okay. I don't know. <laughs> Just make sure somebody's standing around you, and that's kind of what it feels like. Raymond, love that answer, didn't you, Raymond? Yeah, I like that one. This is Jenna. Jenna, go ahead, ask your questions. Here. What was your favorite food up in space? Favorite food up in space. And, and to answer the, the last question, I think there was another part of that question about hearing the sonic boom, and you don't, uh, you don't actually hear it when you're in the show. But uh, most people on the ground can hear because it that shock wave behind you, and you're still going very, very fast. And uh, maybe Dave can answer the second question. Yeah, favorite foods? No, it's a tough one. There's so many good foods that we have. But when you're in space, you feel a little bit congested. It's like you got a cold. So you like foods that are really spicy. So shrimp cocktail is actually my number one. No more food in the pace anymore. You're getting shrimp cocktail up there, huh? <laughs>